Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from New York. So I'm really excited to be here. And what I'm presenting today is called the open access method. So uh, many of you may know that I was involved in the design and implementation of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's open access initiative and also the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. So this is an opportunity for me to share the learnings that I provided from those experiences and also the work that I'm currently engaging other clients. So the first half of the presentation is going to speak very practically about what it takes to do an open access launch and the requirements of that process. And then I'll speak about the programming elements that can happen after launch. And so where do we begin? So first of all, open access is about digital transformation. So the importance of that position is that your organization needs to take certain steps in order to be able to do an open access initiative. It needs to have a core set of technical requirements, staffing in place, policy work done as well. So open access is also a baseline requirement for a cultural institution today. It's not a nice to have, it's not we'll get to it someday, it's not maybe we'll do it. It's a baseline requirement for any cultural organization, whether your focus is art, history, or science. A key point to know as well is that open access is a program and not a project. So many museum digitization projects have been left stalled or failed or discarded over time, especially in the digital space, whether those were experiential or collections research-based. This is a fundamental change for an organization. Open access is something that once you've committed to doing it, you continue to do it for the future. So it's important when you're working through this change that you help your organization see that journey. It's mission critical. There's nothing more important in terms of connecting your mission to your public than open access. It is, if you look at many of our mission statements at cultural organizations around the world, we talk about access and service and discovery. This is the most important thing you can connect your organization to do. And open access enables future readiness. So oh, the key too is engaging in sustainability, the sustainability of our relationship with cultural heritage uh, through digital technology. It's also an opportunity for revenue generation and engagement opportunities that weren't possible with the restrictions of, of the copyright procedures and our working processes. Now I want to talk about the, the makeup of a project team, uh, the project team that leads through the process of transformation in open access. So first you start with your attorneys. Uh, if you have an in-house attorney, uh, they're going to be a key stakeholder in making, helping you make decisions and guiding you through the process. You might also have external counsel, so other legal experts and areas of expertise that you want to bring in that can support the work that you're doing. Your board, so in the case of both uh, the institutions that I've worked with in the United States and abroad, having the support of your board, whether that's governmental or a private board, is critically important. And your director and your executive leadership team and their, their support being on the project initiative is hugely important. And then in terms of actually guiding it through, you'll need a project manager and a project coordinator. So a project manager is the person who's responsible for the, the overall leadership of the project, driving that open access launch through the method, and making sure people stay focused and on task. And a project coordinator is someone, their role is more as to do administrative work, scheduling support, keeping communication open. So two different roles, but important roles. And then you'll likely have collaborators across your areas of practice within an institution. So your collections managers, your rights and reproductions managers, your technical developers, then you'll have leadership from each of those practical areas as well. And then your partners. And it's important to think of your partners in very generous terms. So I think institutions sometimes struggle by thinking about themselves first and foremost, but in terms of their communication about open access, but when you're working with partners, they're part of your team. And so it's important to treat them as team members and collaborators. So now I'm gonna go through the basic structure of open access launch and talk about the core process and product areas. It's things that you have to deal with as you're going on the journey. So the first is your rights and reproductions and your legal tools. Uh, I strongly favor the use of Creative Commons Zero public domain dedication for several reasons. One is it is the most uh, open of the CC tools, legal tools. It does not have a requirement of attribution, and it does also not require someone to share under the same terms. And this is important, I believe, from the perspective of liberty and also from the perspective of reuse. Uh, many people may not want to be constrained by the terms of share alike, and you also necessarily may not want attribution in all circumstances. 
we also have to think about the opportunity in the present and the future for artificial intelligence and machines uh, taking stacks of museum data and media assets and moving them without that process of human intervention. So it needs to be on the human. It needs to be on the human and the machine readable legal deed itself to guide that use. So for the greatest openness, I recommend Creative Commons zero public domain dedication. And of course, this is also contingent upon the laws in your country uh, and what you can do there. Policies you'll need to address. So your website now, your museum collection likely has a whole page of policy statements. You'll have to reflect them in terms of responding to open access. You also may have to change your policies on site in the physical building of your museum or institution in response to this as well. For example, if you have a researcher policy that someone comes to your collection storage, you may have to update that, that policy that allows them to take pictures or not take pictures. In the case of the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, when you if you go to the Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio, you can take a picture of any public domain work of art and you are free to reuse that picture without asking permission from the museum. So the public domain is also physically part of the environment that you can experience in a museum. You'll need to update your request process. So this means your form submissions, your policies around how you fulfill uh, order of requests for images, and your terms of use. So that thing is the policy statement that governs the use of your collections and your content. Another important area is cultural and community responsibility. So you may be working with a certain collection that has an important community of practice or a different identity or expression or heritage that matters to them and it matters to you as a museum steward. So it's important to think through about the implications of your collections and your data, your relationships with your constituents and stakeholders, and how to manage those effectively uh, for the best possible outcome for your constituents and for the public at large. And so you'll have to make changes in your policy. You want to identify a value statement that speaks to the intentionality of that relationship and the work you're going to do together. Then also making sure that moving beyond the value statement, you work into actually making fundamental changes to collections management systems and to your publishing processes and your programs. So if you are working with the community, making sure that you're actually instilling into your databases those changes, working with community relationships, and making sure that the data is visible as they would like to do so in partnership with you or not. Next piece is, um, again, systems and support. Very important, the backbone here. Making sure your collections management system has uh, unique identifiers, that it can publish to the web, that it can export data, that you have a data asset management system that is connected to managing media and image assets, that your assets are of good quality and are in a ready state to be shared, that your metadata is, is clean and consistent as best it can be, and that uh, you're being as permissive as you can be with your metadata, especially um, in the example of provenance or the history of ownership of an object. This is an important area, but also descriptive text. So many museums have made tombstone or identifying information around their collections available, but not the things that actually give context to those collections, which is why the, the metadata is so important. And also updating your websites, your GitHub repositories where people store the metadata themselves, so the code base for their application programming interfaces, and making sure that your servers are in good shape. Speaking to customer service and open access is part of customer service in terms of what we experience and support our patrons and our colleagues, is that we need to improve uh, our inquiry methods of how people contact the museum, how we communicate with them. Uh, and improving and updating fulfillment services. And by fulfillment, I mean the process by which someone requests from the museum media assets or data. So in the past in the United States, many museums charged usage fees. For example, they would charge a fee to use an image on a cover of a book or to use it in an advertising campaign. So once you go open access, it isn't really appropriate to charge usage fees anymore because that goes counter to the mission and the ethos of what you're doing. It is, it is possible to charge for digitization and service fees. Uh, this is a cost, right? It costs people time and money to do this work. It's, it's something that it's an expense and it's a service that's provided. So these are reasonable things to charge money for. And then you also have the opportunity to refresh licensing partners. So in the United States, but also in Europe, uh, many institutions partner with licensing agencies who act on their behalf to fulfill requests. You'll need to renegotiate those relationships and update your policies. Next is marketing and communications. So working with your communications and your marketing team to really help understand how important this initiative is and what it means. So one thing I often say, well, open access is the most important thing your organization will do, more than any building, event, exhibition, project, or publication. So while your museum may have an exhibition or a project it loves and goes back to and refers to in its institutional culture, you only go through the open access process on a fundamental level one time. And it's the most impactful thing your organization can do, at least in our time, in our moment. What happens after that, we have to see. But there's nothing that has come before that will ever mean or have as much impact as this. Also to note that open access serves to support cosmopolitanism in a global community. 
So oftentimes I think we focus, we tend to focus on our regional or our local or our national initiatives, but it's important to remember that open access is about engaging a global community and sharing and participating with a global community like I'm doing with you all today, which is so wonderful and important to building our relationships across the sector and with our publics. And it's essential to sustainability and public engagement. So keep, you need content your institution needs content to share and communicate and dialogue with audience. If your content is restricted, you can't build a sustainable relationship and engagement with your public. And again, going back to that importance of mission. Next, just I'll run through very quickly here the digital content pieces that you need to, to examine when you're preparing for open access. Analytics and dashboards, incredibly important. So many times we get excited about going open access. We do all the technical work, but we don't actually have the reporting to demonstrate the impact and to measure that and to show that back to our boards, to show that back to our public. And sometimes museums can be afraid to share that impact publicly. And so I, I encourage museums to use public dashboards to show the impact of open access. Because one of the questions that we still deal with is, well, is this valuable? Is this helpful to people? Does this make our institution better? So we need to put our analytics where our statements are and demonstrate that impact and value. And then also to understand that if you have, for example, your organization has a application, uh, whether that's for the, the on-site visitor experience or a digital content experience, you need to bring open access to that space. You'll have statements and form for blog posts about the mission for your institution. You'll need to cover your frequently asked questions to help guide your users through the content. The in the news uh, section is very important as well. A lot of museums make this mistake too. They have an open access launch, they have a very exciting reaction in the press, and then they don't actually consolidate and present back to the public the information and the impact of that, of that press experience. And so as time goes on, it's harder for the museum staff and the public to find out what was the impact of this, what was the historical context. Working with your partners is again key. Uh, you'll have to have a big social media campaign, updating your websites, and it's also very helpful to have very good video pieces as well. So a video piece that can succinctly describe the ethos of your mission, why you're doing this, but also just go through this, those basic technical changes. Collaborations and partnerships, another key aspect as well. So who can you work with to magnify your impact? Uh, you can work with artists, you can work with educators, you can work with donors and funders, you can work with content distribution platforms, and you can work with and should work with commercial partners. And then in the United States, we often think about the impacts of this for, as I mentioned before, new revenue and business generation. And one of the things that people say is, well, if I can't license images anymore, how do I make revenue? Well, as Kasha already mentioned, and there's been so many important papers and reports on this fact of the lost image licensing revenue by Simon Tanner, by uh, Ken Cruz, uh, Diane Zorich has mentioned this work as well. Moretta Zanderhoff has spoken about this a great deal. The shift in the value for working with a cultural institution is to optimize the brand trademark. The relationship that you have with your institutional brand and the people that you want to partner with. So it's finding the right corporations, the right independent makers. So you, may, you might think about the Rijksmuseum example of the, the Etsy marketplace of maker communities, but also technology startups. And then the components of the launch, uh, the launch event itself. It's important to understand that a launch event with open access, the primary audience for that is the internet. So while it may be people that are physically in your space, which is an important component, as again, going back to the fact that open access is a global community, don't forget to turn on the internet when you have a launch event. <laughs> Another key example too is you want to show the generosity of your partnerships and have people with you on site and at your launch that demonstrate the impact and the potential of your open access release. And then your press release and your press campaign are really important to do in a thoughtful and nuanced way so that you can inform uh, journalists and, and writers and bloggers across the sector on the importance of this initiative. And just my little bullet point at the bottom there is it launches the beginning, not the end. So the launch is not the end of your open access campaign. It's just, it's just that you might as well think about it as day one. And now I want to talk about what happens after you open access to your collections and how do you actually develop the sustainable program and moving it from a launch project to a program. And this actually means rethinking what museums do. It means changing the products and services that we make to adapt to this new environment. So a first way of, of making the, the experience better is to improve the quality of collections data and media, which I mentioned. And so a key way of doing this is providing alt, alt tags, verbal descriptions for people that are blind and low vision, but also these things benefit all users. Um, supporting translation. So now that your collections data is open, if you have a country where there's multiple languages or you have audiences from your analytics that show that you have multiple language speakers, take the time to invest in translation, either through crowdsourcing or through paid services, so that your content has more value and more impact. 
Also transcription. Uh, many museums have documents or have objects that act like documents, like rare books or archival, archival materials. We need the data to make those assets useful to people so they can be found by change, so they can be discovered and interpreted and parsed. And then one of the other elements, too, is user-generated content, starting to, as Kasha mentioned, too, bring that relationship back into the systems, the core systems. And so as I was speaking before about community relationships, that means you have to work with your attorneys and your, your policy workers on what it actually means to bring that data into a system and how you will steward it and then start writing the policy. And then again, another thing that museums aren't used to doing, soliciting user feedback. So through email lists or through social media conversations or online surveys, asking for feedback asking for ways to improve the experience. Um, it's not something that you just turn on the faucet and let the water run. You have to make sure that people are paying attention to these things. The ethos of the program development, so the sort of the energy, the spirit behind it, it needs to have an energy of entrepreneurship. You're going out and you're creating something new. You have to have a, a drive and an interest and a focus to take this to the next level. Entrepreneurship. This is something that means that within your own organization, you can take an entrepreneurial mindset and apply the tactics of innovation. Again, this is part of an international exchange. So it's not just about you. It's not just about your local community. It's part of the global community. And you have to be open to the idea of engaging in that the content and the collections you're producing now are part of a free market. They're part of a process of exchange. And you are now more aggressively competing for people's time and attention. So the content that you make with yourself and with partnerships competes in that landscape. And what should your organization make now that you have this open data? What should you actually make and put out in the world? So from a digital products and services standpoint, you can think about engaging artificial intelligence, uh, both for improving your own collection data, but also for connecting to larger services and products. You can have events. Uh, so an event that's related to open access would be, for example, a Wikimedia Edit-a-thon. Right now that your collection is available, you could host local Wikimedia and online participation to build that engagement on the platform. You can highlight your collections and your open access content in an exhibition, right? So an exhibition is something that museums are very used to making. We know how to do it very well, but have you actually brought open access through your label text, through your programming, through your content into that space? Your mixed reality experiences, your AR and VR, so putting those assets back out into the world or in your physical museum on site through mobile application. Public programs, too, have discussions with people about open access, right? So it's not just about reading the policy on the website, but it's about convening people with your institution to actually discuss this. And it's not just for the, the folks like us that are watching the webinar today who are talking about this in a policy context, but for the public, they understand the importance and value of this. And your streaming services in your in your podcast and your video. So if you're producing content around open access, you could also choose to openly license the very content you're producing. So part of it's actually changing the way we make the content uh, as EM creators. And the same is true of using social media engagement and also video on demand. So many of you may be familiar with people's opportunity to watch exhibition encapsulations on streaming services or having seen them in a movie theater. So if your institution is making uh, videos about your exhibitions, can you open license that? Can you construct it in such a way that you can do that and share that online so its impact is extended? And then video games. Uh, video games and esports are among the most attracted uh, points of entertainment and engagement in the world today. There are millions of people that play video games. And so if you can engage users with your content by partnering with gaming companies, by sharing your assets, if you have 3D media assets like 3D models with gaming companies, you might actually see your a helmet from your armor collection in a video game. And what could that do to draw attention to your collection and to your institution if you have the right partnership strategy? Also want to focus on learning. Uh, so in the United States, we talk a great deal about STEAM and STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math. We also add A for art uh, to make sure that art stays in the picture as well. Uh, but many museums, whether they're an art museum or a history museum or a science museum, can actually overlap and cover both of those very well because there are aspects to scientific research and conservation of your collection regardless of what it is that can address both of those areas as well. There's still a growing development of a massive open online course structure, so if you're developing online courses either for professional audiences or for learners, you can use your open access content there. One of the things I often would advise education departments around is curriculum alignment. So this is a shift for museums, I would say in the United States, but it could also be true in Europe and elsewhere. Museums historically and education departments have created their own content about exhibitions for their own purposes. But with, with funding structures, whether it's from private money or government, I believe it's increasingly important to make sure that the education content we create is aligned with curriculum standards in, in your region, to make sure that you're aligned with teachers, so you're working with people that are in the school system, and you're also focusing on student-centered learning. 
So education shifts from being about the museum telling the public to the museum working with educators, the public, and curriculum creators. There's also a big opportunity with open educational resources to openly license these as well. So most museums that I'm aware of today don't actually openly license their license plans. They just put up a PDF on the website and don't have any licensing information. So teachers can't actually remix those and reuse them in helpful ways. So again, this is about working with teachers. Online learning platforms, there's many encyclopedias, of course, Wikipedia being one. Uh, there's data repositories, uh, and your data and your media assets, the way that they can be used and packaged by teachers is important. So when I first started working at the Metropolitan, we used to distribute slides, 35 millimeter slides uh, to teachers, but now you're going to be using data and media assets to do that. You can also support open textbook initiatives, which are hugely beneficial to students. So rather than a student having to buy an expensive textbook, which may be several hundred dollars in the United States, and then all of our applications. Most of our exhibition catalogs, as far as I know, unless someone's using a printing press, are made with digital tools. And they're made from Word documents, Word processing documents. So you could make fully available open access version of your publication uh, as a, of a scholarly monograph with open license. So looking at the area of museum publications even further, so most conservation research, uh, your exhibition catalogs, scientific research papers, symposium proceedings, and special publications that publishing arm within an institution, whether it's in a partnership with a university press or an internal publisher, and bringing that to new opportunities with publication is very important. And then if we go to commissions, uh, many museums work in partnership with individual creators. They commission new artworks, they creation, cr commission new code, new research, work for hire, and these new products that take museum collections should be made openly available when they can. And then we'll talk about uh, partnerships, and this is an important area as well I mentioned. So I've just given you some examples of the types of organizations that you can work with in each of these areas. Uh, so the licensing areas there are, are, are known players. Uh, technology, I've worked with a constellation of different groups between uh, Google, Microsoft, Sketchfab, Artsy is one we also enjoy in the United States. Uh, you have your academic databases and research hubs. So some some that I have worked with in the past and know of would be Art Store and JSTOR from Ithaca, and Oxford Art Online also has open access components. And then of course your key partners too are open access partners. Again, I mentioned Creative Commons before, Internet Archive, Wikimedia, and Europeana for you all, of course, uh, working in Europe as well. And uh, we find in the United States too, we love working with Europeana through the efforts they have with Europeana Pro and the efforts they have with Douglas McCarthy to constantly communicate about the positive impact. And so we also love working in the States. And then the last concluding point that I wanna make is that open access is about the commons of now. It's a living, vibrant, and vital commons. And cultural organizations can create content and dedicate it to the public domain today. We don't have to wait another 100 years or whatever the term of copyright is in your country. We can do it today. Um, and so this is, I think, another shift in mind and that open access tends to be thought of as only historical content that's already in the public domain. But it's also our responsibility as cultural institutions to make a vital public domain by making content that is uh, using Creative Commons tools like CC0 or CC BY now. So if we think about the scale and the change that's happening with these important technology trends around us, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, and just maybe even devices that you already have in your home, if you have a, a Google Assistant or an Alexa, uh, you're already communicating with, with machines and software that are built entirely on the open web. They're built on Wikipedia. They're built on open data sets. And if you want your culture to be accessed and shared and engaged with by people, well, simply from their, their smartwatch or from their home, uh, you need to be participating in that and finding the right ways to do that. So that's that's my uh, presentation today. I'm happy to take any questions and and help anyone explore those options further. But uh, don't forget, it's the commons of now. And thank you. Thank you.